Welcome to Advanced Quantum Chemistry and my seventh lecture on Hartle Fock theory. In this lecture, I want to derive the Hartle Fock equations, and uh, as we discussed in one of the lectures before, the Hartle Fock equations are derived by minimizing the Hartle Fock energy. The Hartle Fock energy is calculated as an expectation value of the full Hamiltonian of our system and the Hartle Fock Slater determinant. Now, the Slater determinant is essentially just an antisymmetrized product of spin orbitals, which means that our Hartle Fock energy, which is an integral over uh, Slater determinants and the uh, Hamiltonian of the system, is a functional of this set of occupied spin orbitals. So if we want to minimize the Hartle Fock energy, the things we can vary, we can change, are our spin orbitals. So, which means that we're going to do the minimization of the Hartle Fock energy by this functional variation which we discussed in the last lecture. But there's also uh, an additional uh, condition or additional constraint, and that is we want to be the spin orbitals to remain orthonormal, which means we have the constraint that the overlap integral of two spin orbitals i and j is going to be equal to the Kronecker delta ij, which means if i is the same as j, then uh, this integral is supposed to be 1, so that the functions are normalized. And if i and j are different, then the overlap integral is supposed to be 0, so that they are orthogonal. Alternative, I can move the Kronecker delta to the, to the left-hand side of the equation and write it as this constraint, which is then equals to 0. So we have to do a minimization with a constraint. And as you've learned in uh, your mathematics course, minimization with the constraints one can do with this trick of Lagrange multipliers, which means one defines oneself something which is called a Lagrangian, which is essentially the original function. And then one adds the constraints, all the constraints which have to be fulfilled. And in our case, we have a constraint for each pair of spin orbitals. So we have a double sum over, over all the spin orbitals. And here we have the constraint. And in this uh, Lagrangian multipliers way of uh, minimizing a function, one has to add the constraints in the form so that they actually are zero, meaning the value of this Lagrangian is still the same value as uh, the original function, which means the Lagrangian has the same values as the uh, um, Hartle Fock energy. Um, so therefore we use this form of the constraint. And then one has to multiply each constraint with uh, a constant with the so-called Lagrange multipliers. Now, um, here where we have more, uh, as many multipliers as we have uh, pairs of um, spin orbitals, uh, we can put them uh, all of them in a matrix, but we want the Lagrangian, of course, to be a real function, and that means that this uh, uh, matrix of Lagrangian multipliers has to be an Hermitian matrix. So how are we going to do this minimization? Well, we're going to use this functional variational uh, approach, which we um, learned about in the last lecture, uh, which is just sort of applying this variation um, to or original function by applying this um, delta variational delta to our ex original expression for the Lagrangian. So if I do that. Delta of L is of course delta the linear variation of the Hartle Fock energy, and then it is the linear variation of this expression here. But the orbital energy, the the um, Lagrangian multipliers are constants, and this is also a constant. So um, the only thing which can be varied are, is this uh, overlap integral, which means I'm going to move the delta here to in here. And then we get what we had standing down here, that it has to be an emission matrix in order to, for the Lagrangian to become real. Um, and this is precisely this.
And that means we're going to look at an infinitesimal change in our variable, and the variable are our uh, spin orbitals. So we, can look, we are going to replace the spin orbital Ci by Ci plus an infinitesimal small change in the spin orbital Ci. And then, as we learned, um, finding the a minimum or a stationary point of, of the our function, we can do that by finding for which values of the spin orbitals the first or linear variation in our Lagrangian is going to be zero. And that is what the first uh, variation of the Lagrangian looks like, which we obtain This expression. Now, this variational delta works like a differential or a derivative operator. So if I apply it here to this uh, overlap integral, then I can first uh, change the variation with the integration, so I can put it in, and then remember the overlap integral, that's that's a product of two functions, and we have to use, then again, like with derivative, we have to use the um, product rule. So the derivation of this integral of a product of two functions is the integral with variation in the first function plus uh, the integral variation in the second function. And we have to do the same now for the variation of the hot fog energy. So we have to remember the expression for the hot fog energy, which was the sum over integrals over the score Hamiltonian. But again, we have uh, um, two spin orbitals uh, in these uh, integrals, so we get the sum over these terms where we have the variation in the bar plus uh, integrals where we have the variation in the ket. So that was the one electron term. And then we get uh, all the Coulomb exchange terms. Uh, and remember, uh, so we have the Coulomb terms with plus here and we have the exchange terms with minus. So this is, you can see ij, ij, that's a Coulomb integral. And here we have ij, j, i. So that's an exchange integral. But each of these, uh, uh, such a two electron integral is uh, um, a double integral. So it's uh, an integral over electron one, electron two, and we have four spin orbitals in such a two electron integral. And then using again the product rule, we're going to get the sum of four uh, integrals where in each of the integrals we have the variation of one of the spin orbitals. So here we have the variation of the first spin orbital in this product, here we have the second, of the third and of the fourth spin orbital. And precisely the same for the exchange integral. So we get uh, the variation of uh, um, one Coulomb integral gives us four integrals and the same for the exchange integrals. That was mission. Here, uh, which we have here for the linear variation in the um, the fog energy, and do the same trick like um, interchanging i and j and then using again that, uh, of course, I can uh, interchange also electron one, electron two in one of those two electron integrals, then you will see. Now, let's go back to the term with the orbital energies. Um, so we have the variation here in the bar and we have the variation in the ket. So I can write that as, as two sums, separate sum here with the, where we have the variation in the bar and here where we have the variation with the ket. Now remember again that uh, here we are summing over all occupied orbitals i and j's and those summation indices are just dummy indices, so I could call them k and l or whatever, or I could just interchange i and j. Uh, so if I interchange i and j, I get now, let me try to do that again, I get now here j and I get i and here I get j and i. Uh, and then I can use uh, the rule if I interchange the pra and the ket in an integral, then uh, I have to complex conjugate. So now I interchange the pra and the ket, so this went there and this went there, and I have to do the complex conjugate. And then we can remember from before that we said this matrix of um, Lagrangian multipliers has to be an Hermitian matrix, and that means again if I uh, flip around the indices, uh, then I have to complex conjugate again. And that leads to this equation. And now we can compare this term with that term, and we can see that this term 
is exactly the complex conjugate of this term. So the linear variation of the part with the Lagrange multipliers gives us this expression plus the complex conjugate. And if you look at all the terms that this, uh, eventually I can reduce uh, the variation and linear variation in the Hertha-Fock energy uh, to this term and only those two integrals plus the complex conjugate of uh, those three terms. And if you now collect all the uh, terms in the linear variation in the Lagrangian, we can see the linear variation in the Lagrangian is uh, this uh, kinetic energy and uh, nuclear electron attraction integral with variation in the bra. Uh, and from the electron-electron interaction, we get uh, two integrals, uh, a Coulomb integral where we vary, have the variation in the first uh, spin orbital, and an exchange integral where we have the variation in the first uh, spin orbital. We get uh, here the term with the Lagrangian multipliers, again, where we have a variation only in the bra and the complex conjugate of all those terms. Now we can, instead of having uh, here the Dirac notation for the integration over, over electron one, write that uh, a bit more explicit. Here we have again the complex conjugate term. If we now um, write the integral over electron one in a normal integral form, so we here have the variation of the spin orbital i, which was in the pra, and therefore it's now going to be complex conjugate. Uh, then we have a one electron uh, uh, Hamiltonian acting on spin, spin orbital ci, and uh, the Coulomb and exchange integrals we can then now write with the uh, uh, Coulomb operator and with the exchange operator acting on uh, spin orbital ci, and we have here our Lagrange multipliers in the second spin orbital from the overlap integral. And then we have to integrate over uh, spin up. So this is just rewriting, we wrote it with, with normal integrals. Now remember from the lecture before that in order to have found a stationary point, we have to have that the linear variation of our function has to be zero for all arbitrary variations here. And that means that all the rest has to be zero. And in our case, you know, if, if this uh, uh, variation in our spin orbital, that's arbitrary and meaning not zero, then everything here in the parentheses has to be zero. So I can write that as a separate equation that this has to be zero, or I can also then move the part here with the uh, Lagrange multipliers to the other side, and I get this expression. And then, surprise, surprise, we can see that what we have in the parentheses here is just our Fock operator, which we had uh, defined uh, in the very first uh, lecture about how to Fock theory. And then we actually can write uh, this expression here in a different form, in the form which I've given here. And these are the Hartle Fock equations. They are not the Hartle Fock equations like uh, we've seen them in, in the beginning, because this is not an eigenvalue problem, because I get not just the same spin orbital back, but I get another spin orbital uh, j, uh, j back as sum of all j's. So this is the Hartle Fock equations in the non-canonical form, but it's still the Hartle Fock equations.